ever let oh. this meeting is being recorded oh here we go okay so let me start with land park community association has not had a meeting space um curtis park other neighborhoods have places they usually have their indoor meeting spaces but we kind of kind of worked around you know sometimes we've done it at escaton or at a church or something but uh fairy tale town they have a new storybook center and they with that storybook center in mind they have you know, they built it thinking about us. So um, we are going to have access to that storybook center in the future. There's an indoor and an outdoor amphitheater space. So no matter what the weather is, if it's nice, we can be outdoors. If it's not so nice, we can be indoors. Um, we'll have our key, so it'll be secure. And uh, hopefully we'll have lots of wonderful community meetings there in the future. And it's gonna have AV and food and all kinds of stuff. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, also, uh, their East, East Sacramento is doing a debate on September 28th on Measure O and Measure L. So anybody who's interested in um, you know, learning about that debate and possibly attending, you do have to pre-register. So what you'll need to do is to go, uh, is to go on our website at landpark.org and you'll see the uh, debate uh, under uh, events. So uh, if you're interested in that, there it is. Uh, Rick Jennings and our team, um, let me see. So, so next year, we are going to have Rick Jennings uh, for our city council person, actually as of December 13th. And uh, we're really looking forward to doing a lot of work with him and his staff uh, next year regarding the park. There's a lot of amenities that need to be upgraded. Um, there's some public safety issues. There's all kinds of things going on in the park right now in Land Park. And so uh, we will have more information on what some of those projects are going to be, but they're very motivated. So it's really nice. We have, we're going to have a proactive uh, council member and team working on our, uh, on our park with us. So it's a safer, cleaner, more fun place for everybody from inside and outside of Land Park to come to. Um, also, don't forget there's a low rider car display this weekend, September 24th. It's going to be in the panhandle. Uh, the low riders, the Sacramento Low Rider Commission is uh, having this uh, little event. You know, a lot of uh, low rider clubs will have their own bar BQs and their own picnics, but people are welcome to stop by and look at the cars. And of course, they are more art than car. So uh, keep your hands to yourself, but take lots of photos. <laughs> I wouldn't touch one of those cars unless you're really good buddies with the guy who owns it. That's it. Um, so anyway, that's all I have for right now. Uh, we, our first speaker tonight, uh, oh, first of all, let me tell you, tonight is, is called Trash Talk. And the reason why we chose that is because we really want to talk about, um, you know, uh, things regarding our environment. We wanna talk about having a cleaner environment, uh, whether it's picking up more trash on the ground or in our waterways or um, you know, anything that will uh, you know, help people become greener and cleaner in their homes or in the neighborhood. So that's, that's why we're having this. So that's our theme. So our first speaker is gonna be uh, David Ingram. He is with Sacramento Picks It Up. David is a wonderful advocate for our community and he has done some amazing work cleaning up our parkways with Sacramento Picks It Up. He's also done some advocacy with that. So I'm gonna let David take it and uh, share his experience and there you go. Well, well, thank you, Chris. Thanks for inviting me to speak here tonight and um, share our vision, what we're doing, what our challenges are. Um, I guess as a little bit of background, I'm a local attorney. My office is here at, on W Street, right in the heart of uh, uh, encampments now again with drug dealing and prostitution. So a little, little challenge there that, that begets trash. So that's kind of how I got started in this area. I also live on Garden Highway. So I'm a member of the Garden Highway Community Association. I'm also a member of the Newton Booth Neighborhood Association down here. And I'm somewhat active in, in both of those. And on the side, uh, I'm also doing uh, a lot of cleanups with Sacramento Picks It Up. So as a little bit of background, if you haven't not heard about Sacramento Picks It Up, it's an all volunteer group. Uh, it was formed in March of 2021 by Allison Seconds, who is a person who just uh, got sick of seeing areas being trashed and people just walking by it and seemingly not caring. Um, and trash begets trash. So if you if you uh, allow things to build up, it just gets worse. And that's psych psychologically, that's been proven. So the cleaner you keep things, the you know, just with graffiti, with trash, with anything that's uh, an eyesore, the sooner you get rid of it, the less likely it is to continue to repeat itself. 
So she started this group uh, just to encourage people not to walk by trash, just to pitch in. Everyone working collectively can have a huge impact. Um, <clears throat> we have an email list. If you are not on Facebook, we have an email list. I'm going to try to go ahead and start sharing things now. I'm not great with this, uh, but I'll, I'm going to try. Whoops. What am I doing here? Uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. So is there a way to Let me see what I can do about that. Because that is my entire presentation, but I'll keep talking. Um, we have over 2,200 members now. Um, in conjunction with our urban cleanups, which we do a fair amount of, we have now um, launched into uh, creek, river, and other waterway cleanups. And that has um, really taken over uh, a lot of what we do in terms of our bigger group cleanups. Uh, it's definitely something I focus on. Um, we have uh, connected with mile stewards uh, along uh, the American River, also uh, Arcade Creek and Steelhead Creek. Um, Dr. Roland Brady, who's a geologist and a Steelhead Creek steward, um, has done some amazing cleanups and studies to try to classify uh, what type of debris it, we're finding in the creeks and the waterways in our parks. And um, he's actually, we've done some studies where we've cleaned up portions of Arcade Creek and then analyzed what type of debris uh, is we're taking out. For example, in Arcade Creek near Rio Linda Boulevard, we've, re we've removed with the assistance of the American River Flood Control District over 100,000 pounds of trash and debris out of that channel, which is now dry, currently was dry when we were out there. I haven't been out there since the rains. But, and that's just in like a half a mile stretch, 100,000 pounds of debris. And what we're finding is the vast majority of this is encampment debris. Um, we are finding some legacy trash and illegal dump things like tires, but we found uh, and, and removed over 100 shopping carts in that stretch um, and just tons of textiles tents that armor the bottom of the creek and they basically just choke out any type of aquatic life. So these, these creeks, streams and rivers where we used to have uh, healthy migratory fish, spawn fish, Chinook salmon, steelhead, uh, are, are not, that's not happening, happening anymore. So it looks like we might have screen sharing again. So let me see if I can do this. Um, let's see, so here's our, here's our Facebook group. Um, so we have uh, guides. Uh, some of our members have put together guides. It tells you how to deal with, you know, sharps, needles, if you find those, suggested supplies, how to dispose of trash, um, how to report trash. We don't just like to go out and only pick up trash. We also are trying to hold people responsible um, for cleaning up uh, trash in the waterways. Right now, no one is cleaning up the creeks and the rivers. It's mainly 100% volunteer. So we're trying to put... Um, a lot of pressure on different agencies to clean up the waterways, those that are responsible. And, and everyone passes the buck, obviously. So here, if you go to media here, you get a more, you can go to media, you can see, uh, here's here are some pictures from a cleanup we did last night uh, near Discovery Park at Discornia, Discornia Beach. And 10 of us, well, this was five of us who were on land. We picked up all of this trash. It's about 1500 pounds. It was along the American River banks. Um, that was just in a couple of hours last night. So that's the kind of thing we do. Um, we also have a lot of videos. Um, we have really big cleanups like we had on Saturday. We had, I think, 49 volunteers uh, along Steelhead Creek uh, here uh, on Saturday as part of the Great American River Parkway cleanup day. Uh, we removed um, in about three hours, 12 to 10 to 12,000 pounds of encampment trash and debris uh, just in that one morning on Saturday. Um, we are getting partnership with Sacramento County Regional Parks with the, some sit with the city. Uh, I mentioned the American River Flood Control District is helping out along in, in an area where they were doing some maintenance on the levees. 
but it's uh, we're really building partnerships where partnerships didn't exist before. These agencies weren't even talking to each other, much less getting in the creeks and the rivers and actually digging things out like we have been doing. So we really are trying to share awareness. Um, this is a, just a typical pile of encampment debris that we collect during cleanups. Um, unfortunately, none of this is unique. So let me get out of this and get into... Hey, David, do you have any of those photos uh, from the Board of Supervisors? That's, that's what I'm going to okay. try to pull up right now if I can figure out how to do it. There it is. All right, hold on one second. Uh, David, are you going to explain to us how the trash gets hauled away in addition? I mean, I can see the pickup, but I'm wondering who's doing the hauling. Yeah, one, one second. Let me. OK. Um, we, uh, on our smaller cleanups, we try to haul things away ourselves. I see that I, only, I have less than three minutes left. Um, we try to haul things away ourselves, but we also partner with um, Sacramento County Regional Parks. When we have big cleanups, they'll come out with a bobcat and dump trucks, um, and they'll haul it away. We have partnerships with some local businesses that allow us to use their dumpsters if we do cleanups in their areas. We also really, really push using the 311 app. So if you go to our, our Facebook group and you look under the guides, it one of the guides is just explains how we get rid of trash that we pick up and how if we don't want to pick it up ourselves, like an Ill illegally dumped refrigerator, something we can't move, how to report using the 311 app. So we encourage people to do that. Um, this is a presentation I gave at the Board of Supervisors meeting when we were considered when they were considering adding an ordinance to uh, prevent camping along the American River Parkway uh, and, and Dry Creek. We advocated for um, the critical infrastructure portion of that ordinance to include the creeks and waterways because they weren't originally included and we actually prevailed. We prepared a sample letter um, that was template that was shared uh, amongst our group. Over 150 people used the template and wrote into the Board of Supervisors. So on the very night before that ordinance went forward, they amended it and added creeks and waterways. Previously, it just talked about levees and drainage systems. So that was a huge victory for us. We worked on it for over two months. Um, this, is a, this is a presentation I gave at one of the meetings. This is what you see uh, from the American River. This is an abandoned camp near Camp Pollock and it's in a remote area. So we had to kayak in and this is what we saw. And after we cleaned it out, we see this tiering of this riverbank. So this is actually gonna all get scoured out when the water comes up because the natural vegetation has been denuded. David, and I'm not seeing that picture. Yeah, we're still on the uh, whole bunch of individuals. We're on the Facebook website. Oh, my goodness. How do I get out of here? I'm sorry. How about now? No, you're still on Facebook. Uh, if you're on two monitors, sometimes if you unshare and then reshare, choosing the other monitor, that'll do it. OK, I'm getting there. How about now? Now we see the um, folder with all the files in it. Yeah, I don't know. There's a problem here. Let me try to close that then. Oh. You get more time. Now? Do you see pictures? Yes. Yes. Okay. So this this is um, this is a kayak that Mark Baker was on when he discovered this abandoned camp. We confirmed that it was that it was abandoned. We don't just go in and rip out active camps. We're very sensitive about that. So this is what was left behind. But when we went under this canopy of trees on the bank here, we this is after we cleaned out. I think we hauled away eight to ten uh, small uh, boatloads of trash that was left here. But we found that this entire bank had been tiered, um, which denuded it. it you're, they're cutting in, they're removing natural vegetation and the natural river bank protection. So when the water comes up in this area, which it will, uh, it will uh, scour through and then these trees will eventually fall into the river and get washed down unless some type of protection is added. Uh, most people don't even know this type of thing is happening. It's everywhere. Uh, it's happening 
all over our creeks and waterways. We're seeing this type of damage and alteration to our banks, which is going to have you know long lasting negative impacts. Um, this is Steelhead Creek. This is a cleanup that we did in December. This was a mattress that was just basically buried on the banks of Steelhead Creek. And we had two or three people digging at it uh, on the day of the cleanup. They couldn't get it out. So I came back by myself the next day and I, I spent about an hour just to get this mattress, which was soaked with uh, water and, and sand and soil and silt. I finally peeled it back. Um, and I discovered basically a landfill, an encampment landfill here. And I dug it out for, I was planning on being there for two hours. I ended up being there for almost five hours. And this is what I pulled out of there. Um, and I didn't get it all. So you can see the, the impact uh, that having encampments next to our waterways is, ha is having. Basically, this is all being buried in our waterways, affecting our uh, water, water quality, the ecology, it's damaging, it's choking out the, the natural wildlife, it's going down into the rivers and the delta and the oceans and beyond. A, a great percentage of ocean pollution comes from inland tributaries, and we're, we're a huge contributor right here in Sacramento. It's very sad. So um, this is typical encampment along the American River. Of course, this river is going to go up and all this is going to get swept in or swept up into the trees. Uh, this is uh, one camp along Steelhead Creek along Garden Highway that we cleaned up. We've done four or five cleanups in this area, just two or three camps and removed about 50,000 pounds of debris that's down in the, the flood plain. So again, when the water goes up, which it does, Steelhead Creek is in the background, it floods this whole area and it all gets washed down or buried. So that's, this is part of the same camp. You see, the, this is not unique. We see this weekly. Uh, this is the American River Parkway, uh, camp, abandoned camp. Um, this is under, this is the American River across from Camp Pollock. We uh, did four or five cleanups here. These are textiles that were pulled out of the water and hung to dry below an encampment. We pulled out a hundred bags. We bagged a hundred uh, garbage bags, huge trash bags here, plus shopping carts, uh, debris. It took the uh, Sacramento City brought their boat in and I think they filled it up five times to get all the debris out. Um, this is not easy work. This is in Arcade Creek. This is trying to pull a rug out that's buried. It's not only heavy, but it gets buried with silt. Um, this is what happens when encampments don't move out. All of the debris that I was talking about earlier gets uh, swept into the water and down uh, into the, the rivers and beyond. Uh, plastic, styrofoam, uh, chemicals, toxins, you name it, gas cans, oil. Uh, this is um, the cleanup at Rio Linda Boulevard, at Arcade Creek at Rio Linda Boulevard that I was talking about earlier. This is just one little pile of a section of like 10 feet of the creek where we were piling up debris for the American River Flood Control District to remove it with their equipment. Um, this is typical uh, of what we found at Arcade Creek near Real Linda Boulevard, shopping carts buried all the way up so that all you can see is the top of, the top of them. And again, there was like a hundred of those. So um, we've removed over 700,000 pounds. Let me get out of this. We've removed over 700,000 pounds of trash from our parks and waterways in the last 18 months. We've received some awards locally from the city and Assemblyman Kevin McCarty. Um, again, we have our Keep Our Rivers Wild campaign that's ongoing because no one else is cleaning these creeks and waterways. Um, and I just wanna emphasize that this is not a beautification process or event. This is, this is restoration and preservation. We're trying to restore these waterways back to what they should be because they are, being uh, destroyed at a, at a historic rate. Um, let's see, we, we do outreach to schools. Uh, we have booths at festivals and events. We had a, a sidewalk event uh, with uh, Chalk It Up with some great artwork that you saw on our Facebook page. We're active politically. Um, I talked about the Board of Supervisors ordinance here. Um, we are not anti-unhoused. I want to make sure that, that I emphasize that, but we are anti-environmental pollution. 
and habitat destruction, regardless of you know who's doing it. We don't want it to happen. Um, we have great partnerships with Sacramento City Solid Waste that hauls away our our uh, our piles. We have an even better relationship with Sacramento County Regional Parks. Uh, Delaney's a person there that works with us. He actually they they'll for a big cleanup, they'll actually have a bobcat on site with dump trucks like they did on Saturday. And they're hauling it away as we're piling it up. It's fantastic because it gets out, gets out of the way and then it doesn't get redistributed as soon as we walk away by people that might think that it's suddenly a treasure because it's in a pile where, when it wasn't uh, of any concern when it was uh, you know, strewn all about the parkway or the, the waterway. Um, again, American River Flood Control District, the superintendent Scott Webb, um, is actually put his equipment into Arcade Creek. It's the first time he's ever done that. And he's been around for a decade or more. And he's the first time he's ever seen an agency in Sacramento actually get equipment into one of the creeks or waterways here. And that was because Mark Baker encouraged them to do so after showing you know, the, the, de the degree to which the water, the creek in that area was polluted. Uh, Arcade Creek is 16.2 miles. We have performed about 70 cleanups in Arcade Creek in the last 10 months, and we've covered about two and a half miles. And that's it. Um, the hurdles or challenges that we have are basically there's defeatism. People just give up. Our people say, why are you doing that? It's just going to get trashed again. And our response to that is, mine is, you know, your teeth are going to get dirty again, too. So we should just stop brushing them. You know, we, we have to make an effort to get this trash out and we want to make sure it gets taken away and it doesn't return to the area. So every piece of trash, we our, our textile or tent or cushion or mattress we take out of a waterway, that's one less item that's going to be there tomorrow. One less item that's going to be buried forever. So if we don't start chipping away at it now, we're going to, it's going to be to the point we're not, we're not going to be able to recover. We feel that we can still uh, restore these waterways if we can get agency department help, but we also need a, a civil, a civic movement of not just our group, but the public in as a whole needs to see what's in these creeks because you can't see it until you go stand in them. You can't see it from the bike trail. You can see some of it, but you really can't see the extent of it until you actually get off your bike and go down and walk along the banks or get in a kayak and go kayak around close to the banks. It's the best way to see it or follow some of these trails down in the American River Parkway uh, under these tree canopies and you can see the piles of debris and needles and batteries and toxins and wastes and honey buckets, which are poop buckets. Um, there's a, there, we also have some challenges with uh, agencies and departments that don't want to cooperate with us. Uh, they don't they don't have the funding or they don't have the, the willpower. Uh, we're continuing to work with them. We also have problems with court decisions that are impacting our ability to keep areas clean, like Martin versus Boise that we all know about. We also had Judge Nunley's injunction, injunction. So we have areas where we've cleaned, uh, and now we have encampments moving back in. So it's really frustrating because then you get volunteer burnout when you clean up an area. Uh, and then, you know, two weeks later, there's a new encampment there. So we're trying to make sure that when we get areas clean, that they may they stay clean. And I'm sorry for going so far over my time. I had some trouble with the screen sharing. Hey, but um, that's, I, that's okay. It's, it, it's, you guys do amazing work. And this is why grassroots advocacy from just neighbors. I mean, David was just had a job. He's a neighbor and he just got involved in this. You know, it's not like you always have to have some big background or education in order to do the right thing for your community. So we're very grateful for that. I see that um, Michelle had a question. Uh, Michelle, do you want to ask your question or do you want me to read it? Sure. I was wondering if you rely on volunteers to bring equipment like shovels or um, just for instances when you don't have an agency showing up. Um, it'd be really nice to understand logistics like that in case we wanted to get a group of neighbors together to try to show up and help out. Right. Well, one of the things that we really encourage people to do is to create their own events and to come onto our page and go to the guides file because that will explain you know, what, what, we, what we recommend, what to do. You can also reach out to any, anybody in our group, um, any of our group experts and ask them how, how, to, how to perform an event. We had one at Curtis Park across from, uh, on a, a, behind the light rail across from Taylor's Market last week and we pulled out over a thousand pounds in an hour um, of, of encampment debris all along the railroad tracks there. I mean, you, I think we had six or eight volunteers. We can, you can make a huge impact. 
In terms of what the equipment you need, again, that's in the guide. Basically, it's a bucket, grabbers, gloves, and bags. And if you come to one of our events, we provide bags. We get a lot of bags donated from Sac County and from Caltrans. So we don't pay for bags. And we would prefer that if you're going to host your own event that you touch bases with us before the event so that we can provide bags. You know, every cost that you don't have to incur is good, especially when you're out trying to clean somebody else's mess. Uh, so David, people find you on Sacramento picks it up on the Facebook page, or do you guys also have a website? We, we do not have a website. So just to clarify, we have a, we have a, a page on Facebook that's not active. It was, it's just basically to steer um, traffic to our group. Our group is where everything happens. So if you go to Sacramento picks it up and you find our group, it has over 2,200 members. You can thumb around there and see everything that I've been talking about as recently as Mark Baker's post today, just an hour or so ago about our cleanup yesterday. Um, we also were at Camp Pollock on Sunday. We were at uh, Steelhead Creek uh, on Saturday. All of these have posts um, with pictures and video. We do music videos. We try to make it fun. Um, and if you want to join uh, our group uh, and you're not on Facebook, you can email us at sacramentopicksitup at gmail.com. That's sacramentopicksitup at gmail.com. So we have a growing uh, list uh, of folks that receive notifications via email. We're also on Instagram, but not as active there. David does, you know, another thing that's great about Sacramento Picks It Up is they are such fun people. They do try and make it a party. You know, they try and joke around a little bit while they're working really hard. So uh, I recommend anybody who's interested, go go look them up and, and maybe the Lampart Community Association will be able to do an event with uh, SAC Picks It Up in the future. That's what I'm hoping for. I think Michelle is kind of alluding to that too, huh, Michelle? <laughs> If, I, if, I have a you, question. Okay, if, Beverly. If you, if, you, if you plan an event, we will come. Somebody will be there, I guarantee you, especially if you reach out ahead of time and ask for support. Okay. And yes, there, Beverly. There, when there's a court, I mean, obviously the big court case already happened that allowed people to move back in. But have you guys had any opportunity to reach out and provide information for any of the court cases that have gone on around... Um, community, the impact on the environment um, regarding unhoused and, um, you know, just dealing with the impact to the natural environment. Yeah, I, I think that we were kind of waiting for the Sacramento County ordinance and hoping that that was going to help us. There is a Fish and Wildlife Code 5652 that basically says you can't pollute our waterways uh, and leave trash within 150 feet of the high water mark. But it's, uh, it's really difficult when you have a whole string of encampments to go in and try to determine who's actually trashing it. And then you have the problem of, of, of folks that are, who are unhoused, not really caring about a fine, not caring about a failure to appear to court appearance. So the, the ordinance, what it's going to do is a, allow a 72 hour notice. And then if they don't leave, the, the property gets confiscated and removed. And basically their stuff gets moved. It has to be stored for a period of time, but at least that provides an enforcement arm that's not currently available. So you're, you're in an area where you're not supposed to be. You got 72 hours move. Here are some options for you where you can go and safely camp, but you can't do it here. So, and it's gonna take a long time. There's, you know, we think that there may be 3000 people living along our, along our creeks and waterways in Sacramento County alone, Sacramento city and county. So it's gonna take a while, uh, but we, if we don't start now, I don't know how we're ever gonna catch up. Well, and if we don't keep cleaning it up, I, even if with burnt, we just need more volunteers because you need to keep, this has to be ongoing. Yeah, it, it, I mean, we're, we're trying to keep marching forward, but we turn, turn, you know, and look behind us and things that we cleaned a month ago are trashed again. So mm -hmm. it's really, really frustrating. Um, and we're going to get volunteer burnout if we don't start making some better progress with keeping the areas clean that we've already worked so laboriously to clean up. It's, it's, it's really arduous, very arduous work. It's, it's a great workout too. exercise with a purpose. I've lost about 20 pounds. So people yeah. say I, I look like I've been working out at the gym and I'm like, nope, I just pick up trash. <laughs> okay. I'm in. 
<laughs> I can attest to that. I remember seeing David like a year ago and you definitely look like you've been working out. So um, <laughs> thank you so much for your time. I know you have to go. You have another thing event that you have to go to. So thank you so much, David. If anybody has any more questions uh, for David, you can probably go to Sacramento, picks it up on the Facebook page, David. People can message. Yeah, or they can send me an instant messenger um, or you can email me. Uh, okay. Lisa posted the email address on the chat. Okay, yeah. great. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. Good to see you again. Okay, so thanks, David. Have a great evening. Thank, thanks for letting me go so far over time. I hope I didn't wreck your whole agenda. No, it was great. It was perfect. Okay. okay. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. All right. So next we've got Lisa Moretti and uh, Jessa David. I don't know who wants to go first. I don't know if you ladies have spoken to each other, but we're going to hear about neighborhood recycling programs and some California, uh, Clean California grants and some other grants that people might be interested in. So take it away. I might jump first, Jessica, because I think mine's following up on David's a little bit, and then I'll let you go and talk about the organics, which I know is a is a different um, issue that a lot of people have questions about. Um, so hi, thank you for inviting me. I'm Lisa Moretti. I'm a supervising engineer in the environmental and regulatory compliance section, and I work for the Department of Utilities. And I think David kind of set a, <laughs> a good intro and a tough intro for me because my job is that I'm responsible for making sure that um, we are protecting our waterways and our drinking water sources by meeting regulatory requirements. And as Department of Utilities, we are responsible for uh, taking care of our drainage canals and um, implementing programs that prevent pollution. And as he saw, we're facing a huge uphill battle right now and struggling with a lot of different aspects. And, and one of those includes encampments that are happening along our waterways and along our drainage canals. In the Boise case has not made that easy. Um, we the city of Sacramento, not the county, but the city of Sacramento has had an ordinance about our critical infrastructure in place, I believe, don't quote me on it, but it's about two years now, maybe three. Um, I've started with the city in 2018, and that was actually one of the first things I worked on was defining critical infrastructure that we could be able to host encampments and provide the uh, noticing to be able to maintain things like our drainage ways. And we are currently under an injunction that requires that we do not post any encampments or require anybody to move through the end of September. And that makes us very concerned because we just had our first rain event and one of our big tasks is, uh, is cleaning those drainage canals. Um, we, in the areas that we're responsible for, we do take bobcats in in the bottom of those drainage canals and we remove hundreds of pounds of trash every year. Um, and like David said, it just keeps on reappearing. We'll do it one month, we come back the next month and it's still there. And it's hard to see that we're making a difference and our guys and our team gets frustrated, but we keep on going back in it back again. And our main purpose through those is to ensure that if there's a flooding event that we're not going to you know, flood out a neighborhood because some of our infrastructure is getting blocked um, as well as make sure pollution's not getting. So it's kind of like the, <laughs> the unfun intro, uh, but we really do try to work with the community and I have a couple of initiatives that I'm, I'm proud about that I wanted to talk about. Um, we do have a, a partnership with Sacramento Picks It Up, uh, and we've gotten boats out to work with them to go grab that material out of the waterways uh, and worked on different things. Um, but for anybody, we encourage all citizens to get involved in whatever way that they see. Not everybody's gonna be able to pull up a wet and soggy mattress out of the side of a riverbank, um, but there are lots of other opportunities uh, to get involved and help out our waterways. And one thing that we have going on right now is that annually we open up what's called a community action grant. And I'll post that in the chat as well. Um, and 
that is a opportunity to apply for it's just a one page application and if you have a project in mind that's about education a trash cleanup that needs some funding to get going uh, each project can be awarded up to three thousand dollars and we have a total of fifteen thousand dollars available every year to fund a project. So if you want to go into a school and talk about, you know, how you can, you know, keep your environment clean and not litter. If you want to do a demonstration garden in Land Park somewhere, or you want to put up some signs in Land Park about, you know, trash your trash. That's one of our messages. You know, this can pay for signage. This can pay for cleanups. This can pay for materials. Um, it can pay for a shed so to keep cleanup supplies. So if you imagine it and it makes a difference in our community and keeping trash out of our waterways or educates people about uh, not polluting our environment like littering, uh, it can go towards funding that. So I encourage anybody to apply and it's open up through February of next year for the application period. I think we just opened it up this month. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to talk about is that we were, uh, the city of Sacramento, I'm really proud that a bunch of departments really came together. Um, I think we're all seeing the impacts of trash in our environment and the department of um, Caltrans um, just had a recent opportunity for local funding for agencies like the city of Sacramento to preserve pursue projects that beautify our community and uh, in, encourage people to not litter. And uh, we had six projects that we applied for and we got grant funding for five for a total of 16 million. And those projects include um, uh, one of them that I was most involved in uh, was the Florin Road Community Beautification Project. And that money is going towards creating a youth internship program so that we get youth involved in actively cleaning up their community and seeing how they can be a part of it, but have paid internships, as well as three community murals and a public service announcement where we really focus on how you can improve and beautify your community. So I'm excited about the opportunity to get funding to really in, improve our community. And as those Clean California uh, projects go forward, there'll be a lot of opportunities for, for involvement of residents. Um, so I'll be happy to, I can put a little bit back in the chat about a link to those projects and my email address and anybody has questions, but I'll kick it off to Jessa with, I'm gonna repeat David's ending um, a little bit of that he pointed out to encourage everybody to use 311. You don't have to walk past litter or walk past that big pile of illegal dumping. Um, the 311 app, you can do it on your phone by calling 311. We have an app on your phone. You can do it through the website. If you see a big illegal dumping pile, um, you can report it on 311 and we'll, the city will figure out how to respond to that. And we really need people to tell us because we don't have eyes everywhere. And that's why we rely on our residents to let us know when uh, there are things that need to be addressed and we wanna work with our community as a partner. Yeah, absolutely. And to add to that, there's also uh, with recycling and solid waste, there is a reward if you report illegal dumping and um, what information you're able to provide leads to a conviction of illegal dumping um, perpetrators. So, and that's on our website. So I'm Jessa with the Recycling and Solid Waste Division. I don't know if there were any questions for Lisa, or, um, but I have a presentation to share. If, I think you might have to give me permission. Yeah, give me a second. I'll get you on there. I just have to switch hosts. So give me a second. And I'll keep it ready. You should be co host. Uh, you should, in just a second, you should show up as your co host. And then you can, you should be able to share. Yes. Can everybody see my slides? Okay, great. Okay, like I said, I'll keep this pretty brief so that I have time to answer uh, whatever questions you have. Um, so my name is Jessa David. I'm here with the Recycling and Solid Waste Division with the City of Sacramento. And what we do 
Um, we provide curbside collection to residential homes. That is tends to be single family homes up to four places. So if you live in an apartment building, uh, you know, with 10 units, then probably your trash and your solid waste would be taken out by a commercial hauler like Republic or Atlas or um, Waste Management. And we're here to talk about organics pretty much. So I'll just get right to that. Um, organics is a huge waste stream in California, which and um, when organic waste materials are tossed into the landfill, they don't get aerated. And so that lack of oxygen ends up um, creating methane. So when we divert those materials from the landfill and instead um, process them in a way that aerates them, you know, through composting methods like um, our processors use a windrow method where there's a long, I'll show you photos later in the presentation, um, but it, it doesn't lead to that same generation of methane. So ultimately this mandate is to reduce the generation of methane and toxic greenhouse gases in our landfills um, by recycling organic waste. And there's some information about how to do that. Um, we're getting a lot of questions right now. So if you guys have any questions, um, happy to answer them. Um, but really, you know, all these materials that go into your trash, they, they would be going into the organic waste right now. So you're not, there's, it shouldn't create any new issues with pests or odors. You know, all that same material would have been in your garbage. Bin. It's just moving to another container. Um, we are also offering a free pail to help you collect those food scraps in your home. I'll skip to that slide. Craig is showing us a, uh, a bag here. And um, Craig, do you have a pail that you wanted to show? Oh, I can go grab one. <laughs> well, I have the pail that they're showing there. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, there it is. Were, okay. We advertise the, these, our these bags work really well. The only drawback that I have with them is that if I because they break down so quickly and we only get picked up once a week. Um, I will put, you know, scraps of whatever it may be in there and then it will break through the bag because it disintegrates. So I, I learned to put it in my freezer. So, you know, it's still in a transition period right now. Yeah, yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's a really good tip too. Um, some people like to put their, food scraps in their freezer or refrigerator throughout the week and just add to it. And then the night before collection, you go put it out there. Uh, you can also, right now we have a lot of leaves coming down. So if you have leaves in your yard or other green waste, that helps to layer it. You know, I'll toss in a bag of food waste and if I can put some leaves and throw them on there. Food soiled paper will also help uh, absorb the moisture, which leads to, you know, odor being generated. So there's definitely some, some you know, we're, we're, it's a transitional period certainly, but I think we're all getting there and we're learning. And it's just simple habits to kind of get in place at home. Um, you know, I keep my, my little compost pail right in the kitchen and it doesn't really generate the odor that you might expect because it does aerate it, it has a lot of holes in the vent. But you could also use like a coffee can or a yogurt tub or something. Um, and those, those compostable plastic bags are also really helpful. Um, they just need to be BPI certified, which will be labeled pretty prominently on there. Um, you're not required to use a bag. You can go ahead and just toss that apple core straight into the container, um, but a bag might help with preventing odor issues. You can also use any paper bag, again, like food soiled paper. Um, here's a list of you know, items that do go in and don't go in. If there's anything specific you're wondering about, you can always check on our website, The Waste Wizard, um, or use the, the app, the Sac Recycle app, uh, or email us at sacrecycle.org. I'm getting a lot of those questions, and I'm happy that people want to know how to do this you know the right way and they want to participate. Um, okay, so here we'll get through. Uh, oh, before I forget, just you just go to sacorganics.org and you'll register. Um, press on the little kitchen pail photo there and then it'll lead you to a page to confirm. And then you can sign up to pick up your pail at a local community center. And just to show you a little bit of what we're contributing to. So this is one of our truck dumping some waste at Yolo County Central Landfill. They're one of our three organic processors. Um, and so it starts out really big and then it kind of gradually they um, process it down. So it's really very fine compost material which has a lot of other great uses. Um, ours will go to, or it does go to agricultural users like local farmers, 
um, vintners. You know, we have some Napa, Napa Valley wineries who buy our compost from us. Um, and eventually we do want to offer that to our residents as well in some kind of giveaway. We don't know what that would look like yet, but once we get the program going, we do want to have some kind of giveaway program of this compost, which is very nutrient rich, great for your garden. Uh, any questions? So far, no, it doesn't, does anybody have any questions? No? Okay, uh, well, thanks, Jessica. That was really informative. Um, I will make sure to post some of this information on our website as well, on the LPCA website. And we do have an e-newsletter that goes out once a month to our membership. So I'll provide a link to this you know, entire video because I think this information right here is really important because yeah, some people are a little confused with the new program and, and maybe in the future, uh, if you still have pails to give away, who knows, maybe next year you'll have a new run of pails to give away. And uh, if you did, no, not at all, no? <laughs> Who knows? We, yeah, we don't know. Right now, it's just till October 14th, but you know, things change. Who knows? Okay, so. we'll cross our fingers because you know, hopefully, we'll have the new space and we can have you come and bring pails and you can actually give them away there. So that would be great too. That was our compost, even. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much. And now we're going to have a smud talk. We're going to have uh, Anthony Madrigal. Did I say that right, Anthony? And uh, let me see, uh, Trish yes. Lindell. Yes, yes, you did. And if Thank you, you can give, if you can give me um, the screen sharing privileges, that would be helpful because I'm going to put the slide up. Trish, for Trish, okay, yeah, got it. Okay, make co-host. We're good. Beverly, you're doing awesome. This is her first time doing this. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to out you, Beverly, but she's doing a fantastic job. So thank you, Beverly. So hello everybody. Uh, again, my name is Anthony. I am a Clean Power City champion here at SMUD. Uh, what that means is I'm a volunteer representative with SMUD and I'm excited to be here to talk to you guys about SMUD's 2030 carbon, uh, zero carbon plan. Um, the progress we've made in just the past year and share the ways that you can also get involved and help us to uh, join us on our journey to zero. Um, at the end of the presentation, we will have a little bit of time for questions and answers. Um, but SMUD is your community-owned, not-for-profit not electric company. We're governed by seven board members who live in the wards they serve and are elected by our customers. So because we are community-owned, there are no shareholders, and we're guided by making decisions that are in the best interest of our customers and also our community. Today, we're one of the cleanest utilities in the nation with 50% of our power coming from carbon-free resources. Although we are focused on uh, reaching our carbon, uh, zero carbon by 2030, we're also committed to providing safe, reliable, and affordable power. Um, and we do have some of the lowest rates in California. So I will start by providing a little backward, a uh, little backward, little background on our road to zero. Um, unfortunately, we do live in one of the most populated cities in the country, and the local asthma rates in children are much higher than the national average. Um, that's why in 2020, the SMUD board uh, adopted a climate emergency declaration. And then in 2021, we created a plan to eliminate carbon emissions um, of, uh, out of our power supply by 2030. Um, since then, we have hit the ground running and have made significant process, uh, process excuse me, progress on our path to a clean future. So here's a snapshot of the main pillars of our 2030 zero carbon plan. We do plan on uh, retiring and retooling our existing power plants. Uh, we will expand our use of proven clean renewable resources. We will also pilot and scale new projects and programs, uh, leverage grants and partnerships to um, limit rate impacts as well, and also maximize community benefit to all of our customers. Uh, this will work will require significant investments and will also result in thousands of new clean tech jobs right here in our very own region. Now, I would like to share a bit more detail on our progress over the past year. Here you see the location of SMUD's five power plants. We have used the past year to complete detailed analysis and reliability studies, um, and we're pleased to report that we will uh, be able to retire our McClellan plant by 2024 and our Campbell plant by 2025. So 
So moving forward this year, we're working on performing reliability assessments, developing our plan to retool our Carson facility, um, and monitoring advancements in, our uh, in alternative fuels. So next, we focus on planning our proven clean energy resources. We activated six large-scale battery storage units at our hedge facility in South Sacramento that can be tapped when uh, our other energy resources are strained. Uh, we also initiated several power purchase agreements to acquire solar and so, uh, solar plus storage resources that we expect will be online within the next few years as well. So by 2025, we expect that renewable energy resources in our power supply will be about 50% and will have reduced our carbon emissions by nearly 1 million metric tons, which is almost 50% of our current carbon footprint. And that's just amazing progress in just three to four years. So moving forward, we will continue to execute our power purchase agreements. We will launch more clean technology projects and support customers who want to install solar um, and or solar storage in their homes. We've also been very diligent um, about our financial impacts of this plan. Uh, last year, our board approved a rate increase that were uh, below the rate of inflation which are at 1.5% for this year in 2022 and 2% 2 in 2023. So we will continue to identify savings opportunities and look for other ways as well that we can decrease uh, the need for future rate increases. Additionally, we have developed new internal work groups specifically focused on finding sustainable um, operational savings and also seek grants and partnerships to help support that work. Lastly, we are looking to pilot and scale new projects. Starting this year, we will be implementing pilot programs to build and test our virtual power plant initiatives, um, which we've named My Energy Optimizer. So virtual power plants are the combination of customer resources such as solar, uh, battery storage, uh, electric vehicle charging um, that are coordinated to help keep uh, and meet demand. When we can share our resources and stored energy in times of high need, uh, we are able to power the grid carbon free. And our goal is to enroll 10,000 customers in this pilot program um, by next summer of 2023. Additionally, we do plan to increase um, building electrification projects. We are piloting things uh, like personalized home electricity reports, options for low amp heat pump water heaters and commercial kitchen electrification. And we're also working on um, transportation electrification. Uh, we have a new residential program that provides incentives for residents to purchase and install level two electric vehicle chargers in their homes. And we are working with school districts that have electric buses and businesses with electric fleet vehicles to initiate battery dispatch um, from the vehicles to the grid when they are not in use. And lastly, we are implementing our virtual solar program, uh, which we will allow low income customers to take advantage of solar energy through a program where qualified multi unit property owners can install solar on their complex. And a portion of that money generated um, is returned to the customers in the complex. Income qualified customers will also continue to receive our energy assistance program and our medical um, equipment rate discounts as well. So there are also many rebates and incentives that you can take advantage of on our website at smud.org forward slash rebates. I would also like to mention um, a few things is that SMUD has weatherization opportunities through SMUD approved contractors to help make your homes more efficient and save money on your bills. You can also get rebates for items like heat pump water heaters, induction cooktops, um, and we can connect you with the statewide and local incentives for purchasing an electric vehicle and help you enroll in a discount rate if you charge your electric car between midnight and 6 a.m. Now, uh, we now offer a variety of battery storage incentives um, that are also available to our residential customers. Um, our rooftop and solar plus storage um, systems are a great way to add resiliency to the grid and will help achieve our 2030 carbon uh, free plan. So solar and storage also will help you save money and uh, share clean elect uh, electricity and energy with others. Uh, for new all electric commercial and residential construction and uh, energy efficiency retrofits, we have many programs and services that help support our customers in their transition to be more efficient um, in their all electric homes and buildings as well. 
Some of our latest electrification rebates and incentives are shown here, um, and they will help you save energy in your home and help our whole community work toward a, a cleaner energy future. So replacing an old inefficient gas water heater with an eligible um, heat pump water heater can earn you um, up to $2,500 in rebates. If your HVAC system is old, um, it's probably inefficient. Replacing it can trim your energy bills and increase the comfort of your home. We offer up to $3,000 in rebates on energy efficient heat pump um, heating and cooling systems installed by a qualifying uh, a contractor. We also have a variety of battery storage incentives available for our residential customers um, with up to $2,500 for partnering with SMUD to help make our energy um, system stronger and more reliable. And also when you partner with SMUD, your battery will reduce um, energy usage during the hours when demand for electricity is the highest and clean energy resources are scarce. So for our qualified commercial battery storage customers, we do have an incentive up to $5,000 per site, which is available um, for your commitment to operate your battery system in a way that reduces your electricity costs and contributes to a healthier environment. And your battery is most likely already operating in this mode if you do have it. We also offer a wide variety of incentives to encourage investment in energy efficiency um, for our business customers as well. Our rebates range from simple to custom energy upgrades. Um, business customers can learn more about what's available to them by connecting with their strategic account advisor um, at smud.org forward slash my advisor. We even have a multifamily rebate program um, that's designed for multifamily properties of five units or more uh, with incentives to support switching to a cleaner, more efficient electric space heating, um, water heating and cooking appliances. Electric appliances save money and increase tenant safety as well. So in addition to all of our incentives and our rebates, uh, we wanna give you some ideas of easy ways to get involved on our road to zero. Throughout the next year, we will be sharing simple and free or low cost steps that you or everyone in the community um, can join in to take the charge today. Uh, for example, you can go paperless. Um, you can request that your bill is paperless on smud.org. Um, consider driving electric. Keep your thermostat set to 78 degrees and consider getting a smart programmable thermostat. Um, and there are great deals on the SMUD Energy Store, which is on our website as well at smud.org. Um, also consider switching to an, um, electric appliances. Um, wash your clothes on cold. Um, consider planting a tree or shrub or even weatherize your home. And then um, drive less and walk more. Shop thrifty and eat local when you can. So we're creating a movement and we want you to come along with us on this journey for a cleaner, healthier future. So we hope that you'll be able to start implementing a few of these in your daily life. So this is just the beginning of a long nine year journey and it's important for SMUD to stay connected with all of you and all of our customers along the way. Uh, to join the charge or to learn more and get involved in, in the 2030 um, zero carbon plan, you can simply visit uh, cleanpowercity.org or you can scan the QR code to be linked to the website right now. You can also become a Clean Power City Champion by answering a few questions online. And then also in return, uh, SMUD will uh, send you a Clean Power City t-shirt and a Join the Charge sticker. And you can connect with SMUD also on social media. And you can also be a champion to spread the hashtag Clean Power City message as well. So I just want to thank all of you for the opportunity for allowing me to speak tonight. And at this time, I'm more than happy to answer any questions or comments that you guys may have. Does anybody have any questions for Anthony? Uh, well, I would like to make a statement because uh, uh, I run a small business in Sacramento and I've changed over to um, the, the electronic cooktops. To, they're magnetic. They are so efficient. So there is some positive things about going all electric. So I, I just like to tell people that want to have a new cook. It works totally different than the cooktops that uh, we had the heating elements underneath the glass uh, top or ceramic top. These are magnetic and you have to have a pan that reacts to it and it just cooks really fast, just like you're cooking on gas. So I just like to share that. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Beverly, did you say you had a question? Uh, no, not at this 
time. Okay. Does anybody else have any more questions? Yes. Yes, Rick. Uh, yeah. Uh, SMUD, of course, traditionally was heavily dependent on the hydropower, you know, and of course, uh, just thinking of all the rain we just had and, and the snowpack, I don't know what it is this year percentage wise, but how, how much of the power these days, what percentage uh, is coming from hydro? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I would actually um, have to get back on that unless Trish, do, do you know that um, answer offhand? Did Trish? Sorry, I was trying. <laughs> Oops. My computer is going crazy. Um, sorry, I was trying to find my mute button. I'm actually looking that up online for you right now. So if I can get it, to, I'll put it in the chat as soon as I find it. You wanted to know how much the high uh, of hydro we have right now? Yes, that was the, of course, big traditional smud source. Yeah, let me find that information and I'll put it in the chat for you. My only thing is to make sure that um, we make sure we have some sort of contact information for uh, any follow up questions or anything that may come because this is going to be posted on the um, website, the link to this meeting and we want to make sure if there are questions we have a way to reach you for them. That. So some, something that I was able to find, Trish, um, was that in a normal water year, uh, the UARP provides approximately 16% of SMUD's power needs. Um, an additional 6% of our generation is provided by two um, hydro power contracts, allowing us to meet a total of about 22% um, of total power needs with carbon-free hydro generation. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Anthony. That was a lot of information uh, packed into the packed into your presentations. It's greatly appreciated. Um, Trish, if you have, do you have anything else to share, or are you guys done? We are, we are good. And I'm going to put my email in the chat. You can always email me questions after the fact. I really appreciate you guys giving us the time to come out and talk to this because it's it's so important. Um, you know, as, as Anthony mentioned, our region is the fifth dirtiest air in the nation right now, and we can't do this by ourselves. If SMUD can get all the customers, you know, to, to just do one or two of those tips, it's really going to go a long way. The state is requiring um, utilities to be carbon free by 2040, but we think we can do it by 2030 and we need to do it by 2030. So please go ahead. I'm going to put my email in the chat and just go ahead and email me if you have any other questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, Trish and Anthony, and uh, we look forward to sharing your information, and hopefully seeing you again in the future. Um, you, you can stay if you want, or you can leave. It's completely up to you. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Uh, have a good night. Good night. Okay, Rick Stevenson. So uh, we're going to have Rick talk a little bit about the Land Park Volunteer Corps, about what's going on with the Corps, about some of the work that they're doing in the park right now, and the duck ponds. And uh, take it away, Mr. Rick. Yeah, the Land Park Volunteer Corps, many of you are familiar with. We do nine, in a normal year, non-COVID years, we would do nine park work days a year. Uh, we'll be having one on October 1st. Saturday, we'll be starting at nine o'clock, uh, a little bit later because the sun's coming up later. Um, so the last two, work days, October and November, we start at nine rather than eight, which is what we do during the summer. Um, and, and of course, we were talking, uh, David was talking about cleaning up uh, uh, in the waterways. We do have a, we do have crews that clean up the ponds in William Land Park, which of course, two of, of the three of which are fenced off right now. Um, and there will be work hopefully being done in there, but the Parks Department at this point has told me they still haven't identified the funding to do work on them between now and the time they have to be refilled, but we're going to be working on that quite a bit. As far as the volunteer core work itself, um, when you come in the morning, you sign in, start the sign ins about a half hour beforehand, before nine. Um, we have some light, you know, coffee, some some uh, sweet rolls and various things like pastries. Then uh, we have various crews. We've got a tool trailer with hundreds of tools of different types in it, 
We have crews that do different types of work. And a lot of, of course, is, is also the crews, whatever they're doing, they pick up the trash in the areas where we are. We have been able to keep, everybody has, not just our group, but been able to keep the park pretty clean for the last few years, as opposed to a lot of the other areas uh, around the neighborhood. Um, and then uh, at the end of the three hour work period, then we have a barbecue lunch and put all the tools away and get ready for the next park work day. And it's sometimes we plant trees. We won't be doing any October. We might be doing some in November. Um, and that's, that's about it, unless there's questions or comments on it. Okay, Rick, thank you very much. I have a quick much. question oh. for, for Rick. Rick, how, I haven't participated recently, so I'm just wondering how are we doing with youth participation as opposed to our old regulars? So just curious. Well, you, you, of course, during the school year, you get those that get credit from schools. We have scout troops that show up on a regular, virtually every time we'll have at least one scout troop. Uh, we have other organizations that will come in, uh, churches, uh, FedEx once a year would bring in a crew, uh, occasionally a labor union will, will provide volunteers. So we have a variety of ages and a, a variety of types of groups that participate. Wonderful. Okay, well, thanks, Rick. At Land Park Volunteer Corps does incredible work. Um, you know, it, it's amazing how much the park relies on them to do work, uh, but that's because the park is underfunded and understaffed right now. I don't know. We don't know where all that money's going, where it should be going. So if anybody um, is concerned about the maintenance of the park, and, uh, you know, you're always welcome to reach out to our city leaders and ask them about that. Um, and of course, we, you know, Land Park uh, Community Association uh, supports the volunteer corps efforts. And hopefully next year, there will be uh, a lot of support from Rick Jennings team regarding uh, some maintenance and uh, upgrading some amenities. So that's what we're looking forward to. So thank you very much, Rick. It's very much appreciated all your hard work and being a long term LPC member. It's it's uh, you. You've been a really wonderful uh, neighbor all these years, all these many, many years. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, before we close out, uh, just a couple of uh, things to let you everybody know. Um, we are looking for committee members. So if anybody knows anybody who would like to join a uh, LPCA committee, there's a couple of openings that we have that would really help with, uh, you know, uh, becoming more active. You know, we only have a couple of people on the board right now, so there's only so much we can do. So we do the best that we can. But if people are kind of thinking, gee, I wish they would do this kind of event or I wish they would do that. Well, it takes it takes somebody to do that work. So uh, we, we're going to need leads to do that. So for instance, uh, we need an events committee lead. Um, we haven't had Taste of Land Park for a couple of years, but we just do not have the funding other or the bandwidth to do that work. Um, but you know, there are other things that we can do. Uh, meet and greets, other types of fundraisers, uh, support our local schools, do coat drives, things like that. But we still need people to get on board. We're also willing to partner with neighbors. Maybe they don't want to be a committee member, but they do something every year like a coat drive or something. And we would be happy to support and you know talk with them about that and find out what we can do to help. Um, we need a public safety uh, committee lead. Uh, a lot of people are concerned about traffic, uh, uh, speeding in our community. And so traffic safety is really important. Um, we, that person could also do things like host some cops, cops and coffees, uh, work with our park rangers. Um, it's nice if they have a law enforcement or some sort of background in public safety, but you don't have to. You just have to have the heart and you have to, you know, be willing to do the work. And, you know, so talk with us about that. Um, also, uh, anybody who's really good with grant writing or grants would be interested to talk to you. And uh, finally, we're really looking at reaching out maybe next year to uh, local businesses, have them more uh, involved with us and uh, do some marketing and branding of the LPCA. So that's all I have right now. Does anybody have any questions in general about the Land Park Community Association or any comments? Well, that's super. I, huh? I just wanted to say that um, all the things you listed are, are wonderful, and people don't need to think in terms of they'll have to do it all. Right. Um, the, you, nobody can do 
an event by themselves. Nobody can do safety by themselves, but there has to be at least somebody that can get a focal point for the group and the community. So then we can draw people in to participate. And there has to be at least one person that can hold that space. So um, Absolutely. thinking about this, don't think about doing it all by yourself. Okay. So I see Amy, Barbara, and Larry. Uh, do you guys have anything to say? Any comments? It's a little small group here. So, oh, and Lorna, anybody have any comments or anything? No? <laughs> okay. Well, then I guess that's it for tonight, you guys. Uh, thank you. That was really informative. I think I learned a few things. I hope everybody else did. And uh, just go to our website, www.landpark.org, and you'll see future events and things that we have coming up. So I hope you all have a wonderful evening, and thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> Hi, John. Did you hear me? I heard the thing. I did a nice job. <laughs> Thank you, John. I wanted to ask one question. Oh. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. You know, I just, I was going to, I, 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 we should have asked that Lisa Moretti, there was a guy that, you know, I served, I was around 